Okay, welcome back and welcome to the last day of class. I think we all made it. So, um, I obviously haven't said everything there is about Bayes and we're really just kind of scratching at the tip of the iceberg. There's all kinds of other incarnations of Bayes. We've done kind of a parametric treatment of Bayes. We've seen some of the computational facilities, i.e. Metropolis Hastings and Gibbs. But there's lots of other algorithms out there as well. And so, um, and there's lots of other modeling techniques as well. So non-parametric versions of Bayes where you're using splines or you're using clusters and building densities out of those clusters. And there's non-parametric clustering methods in Bayes. And you'd want to take an advanced Bayes class to, to learn all about that. There's spatial statistics that utilizes Bayes. I tend to think all of time series is Bayes. Um, if you don't think that, you might treat the first data point differently than I do. But you're going to be sequentially updating using Bayes' theorem. How you estimate the parameters in there? You might not do full Bayes, but once you've already done Bayes, why not keep it Bayes? Um, and there's ways to hybridize things. You don't have to do everything Bayes either. So I hope you keep taking Bayes classes, and I hope that this was worthwhile for you. Um, I've kind of I've been looking back at my old material and kind of thinking about how the class is escalating. And I used to give a lot of midterm and test stuff, and now I give you more computational assignments. And that can soak up a lot of time. So I think to relieve you from some of the pressure, I would like to offer you guys a take-home final exam instead of an in-class. So currently, right now, the final is, is scheduled for 7.45 a.m. on Monday morning. Everybody excited about that? Super stoked. Maybe Piper, right? So, so um, Piper, would you prefer a, a take-home? I sure would. Okay. Any, any dissenters? Anybody really want to do this in class? I think I wouldn't want to deprive you of that option. So if that's what you really want, I would wake up and come in. <laughs> so, okay. Um, since I think we're all in agreement, I think what we'll do is I'll give you um, take home final. I will release this. I'll say about noon on Sunday. That's this Sunday. So whatever day that is. Is that the 13th? The 11th. The 11th. Yes, the 11th. I have a hard time adding still. Yes, <laughs> the 11th. Um, so right around noon. I'll release this, and then I think what would be fair if you return everything to me, um, let's say midnight on Monday, the 12th. So I'll say instead of this, 11.59 p.m. Just so we understand what time is what. And I'll say about. So if you're 10 minutes late, I don't care. So it really doesn't matter. And if all of a sudden you're having some you know, massive panic attack right at midnight, and you think it's going to take you an hour and a half because your printer broke or something broke, that's OK. <laughs> you know, if I wake up on Tuesday morning and I have everything, I'll be OK with that. So basically, I'm going to need to get everything graded by approximately Thursday. I need to have everything in. It's really on Friday, but I need to make sure I don't get too close to the line. So I also have been in situations where I'm trying to input the scores 20 minutes before the deadline, and my internet connection fails or something like that. And there could be no bigger tragedy in my book, because so, then I'll hear from it. So I've had to make phone calls to people and say, input these scores for me. So um, we'll give ourselves enough time to get everything. So what you'll return to me is your final exam. So that'll be the first thing you return. Um, 
I don't have a huge preference on what the format is. If you want to hand write it and take pictures with your phone, that's fine. Just make sure I can read it. And so I really don't like it when people are like, oh, I tried to take a picture, but I couldn't get the bottom of it. So sorry about that. Like, I just don't understand that. <laughs> take the picture or get that thing scanned in so you have enough time to do it. Uh, if you send me some files, make sure they're in the megabyte regions and not in the gigabyte regions. They're not gonna be something that's gonna break my printer. I've had that before that people somehow are able to figure out ways to make the file that they send me as big as possible. Sometimes they'll include a graph or something like that. <laughs> it's like, you've gotta do the compression. So anyway, make sure that I can see everything and read everything and understand the answers to your questions. I'm not gonna make it any longer than I would have made it in the in-class portion. So it's gonna be approximately five multi-part questions. And I'm just gonna kind of survey material from the class. It's gonna be comprehensive. It's not meant to be overly difficult. So one more time of practicing. The final will be um, open book. And notes. So you can consult all of your materials. I would never possibly do a take home that wasn't open materials. So, um, so it should be, it should relieve some of your anxiety. You cannot consult with each other and you can't consult with me. So if you send me an email on Sunday night saying a hint would be appreciated, I'm going to laugh <laughs> and I'm going to not respond. <laughs> so, um, so all the, the normal stuff we already know. So you'll return your final exam to me. You'll also return the last homework. And you'll return any extra credit. <coughs> if you've sent me extra credit before to my email, I have it. So even if I haven't responded to you and said that I've gotten it, if you send it to me, I do have it. So when I go to grade, I'll punch your name into my Gmail folder and I'll see every email that you've sent me and I'll be able to see it. If you've sent it to me from some weird um, email address, there is a possibility I didn't recognize it. So if you send it to me from your VP email account, I definitely have it. If you want to double check, you can include a note in here, did you get my email on this date? So if it were issue, and I'll read through all of that. Um, so any extra credit you can put in there. If you have just attempts at problems, include those. So I'd like to give everybody as good of a grade as I possibly can. So when I'm grading, I'm looking for excuses to up your grade. So just so that some of you that might be worried, maybe you didn't do great on the midterm, you've turned in your follow-up solutions, and I haven't given you anything back on that, any feedback. My intention is if you've done everything in the class, there's no way you're gonna get less than a B in the class. And so if you've done everything and it's pretty good, you will get made. So if you look at my grade distributions, I imagine everybody but six people will get a solid A. So it, this isn't meant to be overly excruciating in terms of the evaluation, but I know that some of the work is hard. So especially if you haven't had my inference class before. If you've had my inference class before and a couple computational classes, you know, that's the, that's the benefit of experience. So it gets a lot easier. So remember that also, if you're struggling, it does get easier if you keep sticking with it. First time you see everything, it's hard. Um, anything else I should say about this? Anything I haven't been clear about? Is sure. there any cool problem in primary exam, or is it all under exam like the midterm? Is there any what kind of? Cold, cold no, problem. no, no coding. If I asked you to um, do something, it might be pseudocode. So detail the Git sample something like that. So show me what the metropolis step looks like, but no actual coding. So you're not gonna be searching for your errors in there. And I'm not gonna grade it that, oh, there's no semicolon right here. I guess this doesn't work. So I'll be much more generous than the computer is. Um, okay, so that's my gift. 
Everybody find that to be the most reasonable thing that we can do? Any objections? Awesome. Um, let's go back to this and just kind of wrap everything up with this discussion on empirical base. So from last time, we've got kind of this funny model. If you don't like this, you could have um, n things generated in each one of these groups. So there's p groups in here. And I have some x's associated with that. We only need one of the x's to really treat it mathematically and understand what the properties of everything are because we're going to let sigma squared be known. If I didn't know sigma squared, I would probably need at least two data points per group to say anything about anything, unless I had some obnoxious proper prior that anchored things in ways that probably I'd have a hard time justifying. Um, the prior that we're going to be using is this common prior on all the different groups. So this is going to be true for each one of the groups as well. I goes from one to P. And so what we're doing, it's kind of a funny thing, is we're kind of tangling up the information when we do this in some way. That I'm estimating, even though all of these are IID and they don't have anything to do with each other, I'm somehow still pushing them towards this parameter mu. And so I'm anchoring everything towards that. That's what's called shrinkage. Or you could call it bias. You're biasing the system. And obviously, this parameter is going to control how much we're biasing the system. And we'll see if this is a good idea or not. I think blindly, it's not a good idea. If I just picked any old willy-nilly mu in psi squared, this might not be the greatest idea in the world. I might over-bias everything. Of course, I'd be reducing variability when I do that, but I'd probably never recover from too much bias. So we've got to be careful about how much we're biasing the system and how much information we're encoding here. So um, empirical Bayes has a methodology for doing that. And I think if we're interested in controlling the error rate of the whole system, even though these, all these data points are IID and they presumably don't have anything to do with each other, they don't even have to be on the same unit scale, um, Shrinking everything together is a good idea if I'm interested in understanding simultaneously the error in all of my p-estimates. So I'm going to be coming up with p-estimates for the different theta i's. And if I'm interested in evaluating and measuring my error in all those p things simultaneously, it is a good idea to bias everything. We just don't want to bias it too much, and we want to bias it in a direction that at least makes sense. So you might be thinking, Intuitively, we might want to bias everything towards x bar. So that might at least be where the data lives. It's at least in the middle of all of the data, and we might need a way to justify that. So if I just throw down x bar right here, it might not feel justifiable. And empirical Bayesian does have a justification for doing that. And that's what we're studying right now. You might think this is a violation of the likelihood principle, and it is to do this. You might think that you're double dipping your data, and you are in some sense. If I just plug down x bar right there, it's kind of like going in, grabbing my data, and saying, I've seen that a priori. And so you're going to end up steering your analysis to that answer and probably underestimate your uncertainty in the problem. So we need to be really careful about how we treat that parameter make sure that we don't switch that too small and say a priori we know something that we don't. Um, for all those reasons, like violation of the likelihood principle, I hated this when I first saw it. I was like, ah, oh, this is like messing with my principles. And after I started playing around with it, I think that there's good applications to doing this. And so this will be one such illustration of an application. We'll look at another one in a second too. Um, so I've, I've warmed up to this idea, and I think that careful treatment of empirical Bayes can be worthwhile. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if I like the aesthetics of something. It matters in how well it performs. And so what I might want to do is a simulation study and see, on average, how well does this work on different problems. And I would say, regardless of what you feel about something, demonstrating how well it works is probably the, the end argument to everything. Okay. 
So if we do all of this, if we have this model right here, I've got an FXI, given my theta i's, I can do the Bayesian thing by multiplying by this prior right here. Usually I call that likelihood and I spin those things around. But we understand that equation is exactly the same equation up to proportionality. So this thing right here is proportional to the posterior distribution for each xi right here. And we already know lots of stuff about this. This is a normal distribution right here. When we work it out, normal times a normal is still going to be e to the minus some quadratic form. And we can figure out what the mean and the variance is for everything. This is the mean of everything. And I wrote it down like here to follow a notation that's similar to what you see in the, the paper that I'll show you in a second. I think they put cap B up here to say that it's the Bayes estimator. And they, I think they use a delta function right here. I usually like to denote it with the prior in mind. And I always remind people in my notation, this is an estimator and it had something to do with my prior. So I always like to help people ask me about my prior. So if you're, you find yourself in situations where you're like, I really hope nobody asks me about this parameter or why I pick these things, uh, you're already in trouble. So, okay. so anyway, this is going to be my posterior distribution. It's some normal distribution, and it's going to have um, expectation, this thing that we just plugged in. So that's our expectation. That's what I would get by looking at my quadratic term for my variance and multiplying by my minus two linear term. You might not like the way that I've written this. This is actually one over sigma squared over one over sigma squared plus tau squared, one over tau squared. Those are equivalent to each other. And this is equivalent to one over tau squared over one over sigma squared plus one over tau. This is the way that I always like to write it all down. I like to think in terms of precisions. So it kind of makes sense to me that the precision for the prior mean is the thing that I put there. It's easier for me to remember this way. And so saying that, there's lots of different ways to write things down. What's the variance for all of this? We should know this almost off the top of our head at this point. You might need to go back to that in class final. <laughs> Put the fear back into everybody. Okay. We'll lighten up. Somebody help me out. Somebody knows this. One over sigma squared plus one over tau squared to the inverse. Yeah. And I think that the, the paper that we'll look at rewrites this as this. We can double check. I think those are the same. So a little bit of high school algebra. But yeah, this is right. I know that's right. We've derived that a whole bunch of times. And so this would be your Bayesian sort of model. And I could use this to estimate each one of the theta i's and use this estimator right here. But this estimator heavily depends on mu, my choice of mu, and my choice of tau squared. And so if I pick those real badly, I'm going to get an estimate that doesn't really make any sense. I could say I derived it, I followed Bayes' theorem, I did things that I thought were principal, then you just pick some weird values and you really distort what your analysis is. Of course, if I did have a problem where I had more data points per group in all of this, then um, possibly the, the impact of the prior will wear off. Let me re-see that. If I have a lot of data points per group in here, so if I did something like this, J, where J goes from one to um, some large number, and this goes to infinity, the impact of this thing will wear off. And so that's kind of nice. So I have a bunch of data points from each one of these. If I have a whole bunch of those, then I'm going to have my estimate is going to be centered around the grouped means. Yeah. In the original model, where's the size of the estimate? Oh, is that? Oh, gotcha. That's the easiest fix. So 
I always wondered why my professors did things like that. Or can you just keep it in your mind whether it's gamma or lambda? Now I know. <laughs> I still don't know the reason, but now I know how susceptible people are. Thank you for that. Okay, so if I have lots of data, then the prior will wear off and it wouldn't really matter which prior I picked as long as I cut mass over where the answer was. So we've kind of learned that. That's all nice. At the end of the day, your answer is still just conditional on the data that you have. So that's just an idea. So I would say whatever the empirical Bayesian is doing and the full-blown likelihood principle following Bayesian is doing, asymptotically they would converge into each other. I still don't care. <laughs> you know, I still think at the end of the day, you have a problem with only so much data. And I think it matters what your actual inference for the, an actual problem is, not theoretically how would everything behave as n goes to infinity. Um, hopefully we all do things right when n goes to infinity. If you don't, you're doing things horribly wrong, but it doesn't mean that you're doing things right. Okay, I'll let you think about that a little bit. So um, here's what the empirical Bayesian does. So the empirical Bayesian, and the name is der derived um, through the idea that we're going to actually plug in our data that we've observed to estimate these parameters. We're not going to do it directly. So I'm not going to try to fit my prior to all the data points in here. I'm going to fit something else to the data that's going to involve all of my hyperparameters. So the marginal distribution, fxi, has all that information in it. It has information from the sampling distribution and the prior distribution. And all of the hyperparameters are always involved in the marginal distribution. So that's just this thing. So this is fxi given theta i times pi theta i. This is going to have the mu and the tau squared in there. And we know what this thing is. This is a normal distribution. It's going to be centered at mu, where the prior is centered. And it's going to have variance tau squared plus sigma squared. So to do that, you need to do some completion of the square. So you're going to have to recognize quadratic and linear minus two linear terms. To recognize what that completion of the square term is, you'll include that term, re-expand everything, and re-recognize the quadratic term and the minus two linear term, and it'll give you those things. So that's the step for the extra credit that I asked you for for 5%. It's just detail, not the integral. If you'd still like to turn that stuff in, I'll accept it. So I think I said a couple weeks ago, just turn it in by some Friday. If you're like, oh, I'd really like to turn that in now, I'll still take it from you. Okay. We want to detail all those steps here, but we've done that integral a bunch of times effectively. So what the empirical Bayesian is going to do is they're going to work with this distribution and they're going to try to estimate these parameters. So let me just show you in the paper where they do all this. both to the website that we'll be looking at. Um, so I, I posted the, the Bayesian lasso paper, we'll look at it in a second. And I've also posted this paper. So they're at the bottom of the, the course schedule. So here is this paper. This was written a long time ago. So 
we'll just look at it here. So George Casella wrote this, so he's the name that pops up all the time. He probably wrote your inference in your probability book. So he's also written a ton of Bayesian books. He's not just a Bayesian, he's an everybody. So he does all kinds of stuff. And so I really appreciate that, that he's trying to understand the properties of all these methods and not just saying, hey, my team is this team over here and I just sign with them no matter what. So he's an everybody. Um, here's the basic model. So same model that we set up. So this is, make sure that we can see this. You. Marty zoomed all the way in. Can everybody see that? It says normal distribution, centered in theta i with variance sigma squared. Here's our prior. It's conveniently the same notation that we wrote down eventually. And here's our base estimator. And that's written, you know, the way that I wrote it down first. And here's everything we said. Here's the marginal distribution, fxi, is that thing. Same stuff we've derived in class. So all that stuff is used. And so at the end of the day, the empirical Bayesian does something a little bit different. So here's what they write down. Now there's a lot of different types of empirical Bayesians, just like there's a lot of types of everything. And some people might take the data, plug it into this distribution, so I might write down the likelihood function for mu, tau squared, and sigma squared. How would I do it? I would just write down e to the minus one half um, xi minus mu squared divided by tau squared plus sigma squared. I'd have my one over square root tau squared plus sigma squared out in front of here, and I would take the product. So that's my likelihood function for all of those parameters. So i goes from 1 to p. And if I had another index in there, then I would have another product in there as well. So there's my likelihood function. And there's a bunch of stuff you could do with this. I could try to maximize this as a function of mu, sigma squared, and tau squared. And it would give me slightly different answers than what they've done here. So that would be the maximum likelihood way of doing um, empirical Bayes. What they've done is they've done what's called a method of moments approach. And I'm not sure why they did this. I don't think that there's any particular reason one way or the other. Um, the unfortunate thing in theirs is the, the result that I'm going to demonstrate can be worked out for when p is 3 or greater the Stein paradox is something that happens. We'll look at that in a second. Um, they set it up so that P has to be at least four. So that's the one downfall to using their estimators. But I think we can all agree on this stuff. The, the MLE would still be centered around X bar. The variance estimates would be a little bit different. There's different ways to do it. So if I look at X bar, that's just my sum of the XIs divided by P. Right here, we know what the expectation of each one of the xi's is. Each one of the xi's has expectation mu, so the average of the xi's has expectation mu. And so that's true. No discrepancy here. So no mathematical errors. This is also true, and we would have to justify this. We won't do it. We're just going to use the result. P minus 3. This is why p has to be at least bigger than 3 to use this estimator. But it's at least under, easy to understand if you believe this. Minus x bar squared. This thing happens to be sigma squared over sigma squared plus tau squared. So that's kind of the one step. We won't prove that, but you could prove. And I could probably give this to any first year probability student and have them chisel away at this for a little while. Real quickly, what is this random variable? Some random variable and it has some property and it has some expectation. So let me just ask a slightly different question. How 
how is this distributed? Just the thing in the denominator. It's chi-squared. It's a scaled chi-squared. So it's off by a scaling. So I'd have to make it unit variance for it to be the typical chi-squared thing. But it's some sort of a chi-squared. So this is an inverse chi-squared. And you might think about that as some sort of an inverse gamma. And so if I asked you to work out the expectation on this thing, you could do it. So it's just rescaling an inverse gamma distribution. So you could think about it that way. And so I can come up with that. It's equal to that. How do we know? George Gasson does. So, and we could work it out and we could verify it. Here's the sidestep that the empirical Bayesian makes. They take this thing and they say, I'm going to use this ID and I'm just going to plug in for mu. When I see a mu, I'm going to estimate it with x bar. So they're going to pull out the expectation operator and just say, eh, if the expectation of that thing is mu, then x bar is approximately mu. They'll use that as their estimator. They'll define that by throwing a hat on top of this thing. And then they're going to take this thing, sigma squared, over sigma squared plus tau squared, but they'll throw a hat on the tau squared right here. You don't need a hat on the sigma squared because it's known. If you're estimating the sigma squared, you'd need a hat on that. You'd need some other test statistic. And this thing right here is just going to be p minus 3 squared over some of the xi's minus x bar squared. So when I throw the hat on, then I write it z. So I'm going to just use that as my estimator. So anywhere I see sigma squared over sigma squared plus tau squared, I'm going to swap that thing in there. And what they've done is they've collapsed all that information from all of the xi's to estimate these common parameters, because they're all the prior is the same for each one of those things. So they're going to use all their data simultaneously to estimate those things, which is a little bit weird because all the data was IID, didn't have anything to do with each other. My example from last time was maybe this is bowling ball prices across the world, pixie dust, and gamma radiation. I need some other arbitrary, nonsensical thing. So the amount of flour that's used on, um, what's that show that they bake cakes? Show? Yes, so the amount of flour that they use in a typical year on that, it's a random variable. So, very good. <laughs> so, something arbitrary. Um, you probably wouldn't build Stein estimators for something quite that arbitrary because there's no reason to measure all those things simultaneously, but you get the point. So, so every time I see in our Bayes estimator, this thing right here, I can substitute it with something. So I can substitute it with that. And you'll notice that this is one minus that thing right here. So these weights add up to one. So one minus this thing right here, I can substitute right in there. And for mu, I can substitute x bar for that. So I can just plug these things in. So I'll plug in the tau hat right here. So this thing right here is just 1 minus p minus 3 over sigma squared over some of the xi's minus x bar squared. Okay. This is Stein's estimator. So this is an empirical Bayes estimator. When Stein derived this, he didn't use the, the Bayesian way of thinking about it. He was shrinking everything towards something. And if you're a Bayesian, you're like, oh, that just means common prior on everything. So there's ways of thinking about things that have penalties built into them through um, Bayesian analyses. That's how Bayesians always treat everything. So if you have a penalty for me, I'll encode it in my prior usually. Um, so this is one way of thinking about Stein's estimator through a ba empirical Bayesian lens. And so this is the estimator that they come up with. So by plugging all that stuff in, they got x bar for mu. So I think they flipped this thing around. They plugged in this estimator right here for sigma squared over sigma squared plus tau squared. And then they have the one minus thing. 
and that's still being multiplied by the xi. So that's the same form of the estimator, but it's a little bit different. I'll end up just showing you this result right here. I'm actually going to simulate this for you in a second, but this is a pretty cool graph. And so you can't really read these axes. This says MSE. And this is a product of the time. Like this says risk right here. But you can't really read it. You can see that it was like typed in after the fact. So risk in their case means the base, the, the, not the base risk, just the risk function for the base estimator. And under an L2 loss function, the risk is mean squared error. So, so what is mean squared error? It's your estimate minus the truth squared and averaged over it. So typical thing that you probably didn't do on since you were an undergrad. So the mean squared error for the MLE model, so if I had groups and I had different samples from each one of the groups, I'd plug in X bar for each one of those. We talked about that last time. For our case, the MLE is just beta hat I, I'll call this MLE, is equal to X I. So question is, is what's the MSE for the group averages? We know the, the answer. So what's the, the mean of the group averages? The mean is the mean, it's mu. What's the variance? Sigma squared over P. It's usually sigma squared over N. So why is that true? Because mean squared error can be decomposed into bias squared plus variance. Maybe you've seen that before. This is an unbiased estimator, so what's the MSE? For an unbiased estimator, it's the variance. What's the variance of the total system? It's sigma squared divided by P. And you've derived that a whole bunch of times, thinking about it different ways. That's a constant risk function. So this is the risk um, for the MLE. And it's constant everywhere, maybe that's cool. The Bayes estimator that we just came up with, the empirical Bayes estimator, AKA Stein's estimator, looks like this, the risk. So it's this increasing function, but it asymptotes into this. It actually never crosses the line. You'd have to asymptotically prove that, but I think it's compelling enough, the figure. Never actually crosses it. What are we getting out of this thing? Is we're biasing everything at zero. So what they actually did in this plot is they took X bar, and they just got rid of it, and they plugged in zero for it. They actually shrunk everything just towards zero and not X bar, and they simulated everything out of something that was normally distributed around zero. So if you want to know what they did in this. So really, where they shrunk everything, whether or not they picked X bar to plug that thing into or actual zero, uh, your risk is a lot lower towards zero. So where true theta, and this is, there's three thetas, so this is really just the norm of all of them is what we're plotting. If they're centered around zeros, then the phase estimator does better, and it makes sense. What's not obvious is that after a while, as I start moving away from where I've shrunk everything into, that it doesn't cross up here, and it never does cross. Here is the Bayes estimator with some really bad mu and tau squared plugged in. So they picked a mu and a tau squared, they plugged it in, they didn't estimate anything, they just picked some bad values, threw it in there and showed, the, the Bayes estimator could be terrible if you picked really bad mu and tau squared. And this is demonstrating that. And as I moved away from where I centered everything, this could do really badly. So, but the Stein estimator itself actually does really well. And so if you don't like that you've double dipped your data and broken the likelihood principle, this graph is at least compelling is to, uh, if I knew something about the system and I knew where to shrink it to, I could do a lot better over in this region. If you don't like any of this and you're like, I hate that because I've convoluted all these IID things and I usually think that I'm probably estimating things away from where I've shrunk everything. And if you used your MLE and you continue to use the MLE or the independent estimator, after a while, unless you have really good subjective knowledge on where to shrink everything to, or you could shrink it towards X bar, maybe it doesn't matter that much. So I kind of like that too, that if people use their MLE, they didn't have a lot of good subjective wisdom on where to shrink everything to. Maybe we're just mincing over epsilon. But the key point is that it doesn't cross. 
Um, I want to show you just one more paper, and then I want to conclude with a quick simulation. This paper I've already, I also put up online. I did that this morning. This is the Bayesian Lasso. This is written by Trevor Park and George Casella. So Trevor was one of Casella's graduate students. So Casella's back in the game again with another seminal paper. And this is pretty cool. So here's the Lasso model. We talked about that last week. So here's Lasso right there. And so maybe you want to do this in a Bayesian way, and there's a Bayesian way of thinking about it. There's something really cool down here that I've highlighted for you. That this is a double exponential distribution. That is the prior that you're using in Lasso, if you like to think about it as a Bayesian. There's a mixture representation of the double exponential. You might not like the double exponential when you're coding it up because of the absolute value signs, when you're playing around with things. Maybe you don't like that form. There is a mixture representation of it. This is a normal distribution mixed with an exponential distribution where the exponential parameter is alpha squared over two, where alpha is the um, regularization parameter. It's what we usually call lambda in the, the lesson. So there's a way you can exploit that in Gibbs sampling. So if you think hierarchically in using these mixtures, you can do a Gibbs sort of thing. So just remember our Cauchy regressions that we did. We didn't use a Cauchy likelihood. We didn't use that form, we used a mixture, a scale mixture model. We were able to exploit that. Casella is able to exploit that same thing, and he tells you what the um, full conditional distributions for everything are. So he tells you what these are, he outlines what they are, basically he's telling you how to code up the, the Gibbs sampler. What he doesn't tell you in this is how to pick lambda in all of it, the regularization parameter, the lasso parameter. And down here, he gives you an empirical Bayesian method for doing that. And I've highlighted this for you as well in the paper. So there is an empirical Bayesian approach. If you're an empirical Bayesian, keep in mind, you've got this prior distribution. And it's like, how do you use data to estimate your prior distribution in some weird way? Empirical Bayes is the answer to that. If you wanted to plug in data and try to center things around, empirical Bayes is one lens that you can look through. Um, I'm not going to go through this derivation, but he goes through it in the appendix of this paper. And he derives that this is a good estimator. So in his Gibbs sampler, what he does is he plugs this thing in at every step. So he's going to be co-estimating in an empirical Bayesian fashion um, what lambda is. And this is just an iterate that you're going to have where the Gibbs sampler is going to run through iterations on K. So you'll be updating this as well. There is an expectation problem right in the middle of all of this. And so you have to do a Monte Carlo expectation to estimate all of this. So we're not going to go through all of that. But there's all these different layers you can do. I think Bayesians have thought about all these layers, zillions of layers, you know, for doing things and coding them up in Gibbs samplers. So the empirical base trick is kind of a neat trick. I'll just conclude and run a little bit of code for you. Um, I wrote this thing. I'll post this maybe to the Slack page if you'd like to look at it. But I've got a piece of code called Stein. Let's see. James Stein. Let me just open that up real quick. So I've written this piece of code, and it really just is a Monte Carlo estimate of that's a little bit bigger. It's just a Monte Carlo estimate of that risk function for this. So I can estimate MSE by doing a simulation study. Boom, over and over again. Instead of actually having the expectation operator, I'm replacing it with an empirical average that I get by running it through a big for loop. So let's just run that. Boom. This is my Monte Carlo estimate, I think probably I, I haven't left myself quite enough time maybe to go through all of this. But I've left a Monte Carlo estimate of this straight line right here. If you actually look in on the scale on this, it's really zoomed in real closely. And so this is actually a pretty good estimate of the MSE for the, the independent model using the MLEs. So if you just want to see how much Monte Carlo variance, and you can, um, 
go through and um, crank up the number of iterations if you want this to follow the line a little bit closer. Let me see. I think what I'll do is I will just post this code to the Slack page. You can play around with it. But there's some toggles in there that will simulate also that risk function for James Stein's estimator. There's also another thing that they talk about in that paper, and it's called the James Stein's positive parts estimator. So I guess somebody way back when said, okay, if you do all of this and you're trying to estimate um, all of your, um, let's say all of the things that you're estimating are different exchange prices on different stock markets. And maybe they have something to do with each other, but maybe it's not clear exactly what they all have to do with each other. So maybe they're orthogonal in some sense. Are you saying that you can use James Stein's estimator to predict all the yield out of all of these um, different hedge funds? And if you do use James Stein's estimator, when you come over here, you're gonna have this one minus term. And so you could get negative things. So when all of your inputs, all of your XIs are positive, you could get something in response that's something that's negative using the James Stein estimator. So there's something discussed in here, the James Stein positive parts estimator, where you just truncate everything with zero if you see a negative thing. And I've seen people use that regularly. And the James Stein positive parts estimator actually goes above the MSE for the, the MLE. And so I don't know why people use it. So I wanted to just point that out. Let me run this again. I'll post a Slack, that graph, with all of the estimators on there, and I'll include the code that I used to do that. So I think with that, we might as well end on time for the last class. So thanks so much, you guys. I've really enjoyed it. And hopefully, I'll see you around campus you know, in the next semester. And if you ever have Bayesian questions, swing by my office, and I'm happy to have that with you. Thanks, you guys.